on his birthday. I dream away. Ouch. Howdy, folks. Right now, uh, April 14th, 2020. Uh, we are still in the whole thing of the mid, uh, mid uh, COVID 19 crisis, and it's actually April 14th, my birthday. But uh, unfortunately, I had to have to come into the office today to see a couple of emergency patients. Uh, I wanted to kind of talk to you about it and, and uh, how we did it and show you these couple of cases. One of the cases was incomplete, just calcium hydroxide, and the other two, I completed it because we had enough time for that one, the second two. So let's quickly talk about that as I walk back home after I'm done here at work, and we can discuss some of the thinking and uh, uh, whatever it is that I did on these two cases today on April 14th. All right. All right, so I've been seeing emergency patients from time to time. Of course, that has come at a price that many of my colleagues are like, oh, we have to stay home and so on. But again, remember, we do have an obligation to our patients. We can't just uh, say to people who are in pain to uh, continuously just ignore the pain and do nothing about it. So as you'll see from my couple of patients that I did today, these patients really were in a lot of pain. They couldn't wait any longer. They had both been on antibiotics for a while before uh, by their general dentists and essentially they had to be treated so we couldn't just completely ignore the situation any longer so the first person that i ended up seeing today was an anterior tooth who had some swelling so this patient had a little bit of cellulitis going on in the anterior areas and we did a diagnostic and we found out it's tooth number seven during these times because of the fact that we need to have minimize the amount of time that the patient's in the office. I took a CBCT in this case, also because of the fascial space infection that was present, along with our vitality tests and the other tests that we did. Turns out that tooth number seven was the one that was causing was the culprit, and it was tested necrotic with acute apical abscess. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the way we set up these patients and what we do in terms of operations to reduce exposure. One of the things that I think is really important is to make sure that the patient's as protected as we are, because obviously we do our best in terms of disinfection of the operatory and the area between patients. But what I'd like to make sure is that patient's wearing the same type of a gear that I am wearing. So the moment patients walk into the operator, or to walk into our office, we take the temperature, then we have them go and uh, wash their face and wash their hands and come back and we give them a gown kind of a head covering as well as a mask to wear throughout the office. The only time to take off the mask is when I'm trying to actually look inside the mouth and do an examination. Uh, immediately when we have the uh, diagnosis, they put the mask on until I'm giving the anesthesia. And then finally, the uh, um, when we get started to work on where they take off the mask and I put on the rubber dam. So that limits the amount of time that they're over there with the mouth open. Oh my God, such beautiful. It's amazing that we're having such wonderful weather and uh, spring just a, was it, a week or so ago when I made that other video where it was snowing out here. And now we have the dogwoods in full glory right here. And we've got some uh, nice blossoms. Why don't we just sit here and talk about the rest of the stuff? All right, so what we did for this first patient is following diagnosis and uh, isolation, put the rubber dam on obviously, and uh, we uh, got started access through the crown. What's, what I found to be a big challenge is actually seeing through the shield with the microscope. What's nice about the scope is that it actually allows me to be a little bit farther away and maybe sit straighter in uh, you know, relation to the patient, but it's also very difficult to see through the scope once you're having your glasses on and then uh, a shield on. It keeps you too far away from the objective, so your field of view becomes very narrow. So I had to go a little bit slower on that side for the access preparation. Of course, it was through a crown. This tooth was broken down as well. Uh, previously was a history of trauma in this patient, was, was pretty young, and uh, finally got into the tooth. But here's the key thing, is when looking at the CBCT, the importance of the CBCT in a tooth like this, you want to do your maximum amount of treatment planning before you get inside the tooth. And something I've been doing, which I haven't seen done anywhere else yet, uh, I think this is an important thing to do, and I'm hoping that I could probably talk about this a little bit more when it comes to CBCT, is to the identification and the decision making in terms of your master epical file based on the CBCT. And in this particular case, what I did is I used the, uh, the measuring uh, tools in 
my X100 in order to measure the diameter of the canal. And here the key is to find the smallest diameter of the canal because the largest diameter could potentially cause you to um, perforate the root. So measuring the smallest diameter of the canal, you've got a bunch of sparrows over there chirping. <laughs> That's one of the beauties of spring and too bad not too many people are out here uh, enjoying it. But using the diameter of the canal, what I found is that what I'm gonna end up doing is we're gonna end up having an apex diameter, apical diameter, that's gonna have to be about a size 60 in this tooth. That's one of the benefits from a CBCT because you can gauge the canal in advance using a high resolution of CT add a little bit of a higher magnification that is fairly accurate. And I also found that the uh, diameter a little bit farther up would be the equivalent of about a size 4006 at that full 16 millimeter cutting shank. So given the fact that this was about a 24 millimeter working length in this tooth from the CT2425, and I was expecting about a 15, 16 millimeter root on this tooth, the measurements were coming out to me to so that I could use two files to combine. 106 taper file to address the taper, and then a final apical file, which would have to be obviously a smaller taper because if I use a 6006, it's gonna blow away all the coronal tooth structure. So what I ended up doing is I ended up using a 4006 to prepare the taper up on top, and then a 6004 to finish up the apex using the end of sequence 4006 and the end of sequence 6004. So this combination could be done with only two files. I managed to get in there and create this shape very quickly. Once the 6004 was uh, done and completed, now I managed to put in a 6004, got a percha cone that fit beautifully, took an x-ray, was filled to the end of the root. Now the question here is that we have a patient that has some uh, swelling. Is it a good idea to finish the case completely in one visit? So the way you can find that out is if you've done your adequate shaping and cleaning and disinfection and you don't have any drainage. So at this particular tooth, I used a couple of paper points to see if there is drainage and there was drainage. Although I had managed to use negative pressure originally to suck out as much of the uh, solution as I could, I realized that there was still some uh, drainage going on, although that not much, and I didn't feel comfortable filling a tooth that there was still drainage on the paper point. So in this particular case, what I did is I just used the uh, cast hydroxide, I used the UltraDense by uh, UltraDense uh, uh, products and put in the minimal waste tips on there and go in all the way to the end. Now, you don't have to go all the way to the end. The minimal waste tip at the bend is about 25 millimeters. So you can reach all the way to the end of the apex on this tooth, but what I was worried about is if I, by overfilling. So I go to the end of the root and back off about three millimeters, inject a little bit and slowly back out. Uh, making sure that I'm not staying in there too long because it's better to have less in there and not overfill than to have too much and overfill. And it looks like we had a gang of motorcycle uh, people passing by. Anyway, so in this particular tooth, I uh, did place the um, calcium hydroxide and then I put a small amount of Teflon tape, which is a little bit better than uh, cotton because Teflon tape is not going to get infected and you don't have bacteria adhering to it. So a Teflon tape, and then I put on a little bit of the blue uh, liner on there, BC liner, as a long-term provisional, just because we don't know at this point how long this patient's gonna have to stay in calcium hydroxide. This was a very quick way, as you saw, uh, essentially this, this whole thing took about 10 minutes or so. The access actually took much longer than anything else. And a combination of using the, these two files to get create the taper first to the apex, having the apex locator connected with the endosync AI to measure the length, then finishing the apex to a large enough diameter, that's the fastest way I can remove the biofilm by going to a large enough diameter that I can then touch the walls and clean it. That's a whole other area that should be discussed, which is very important to talk about. So I think uh, this is gonna end up being a little bit too long. So we put the calcium hydroxide and we're gonna finish the case a little bit later on. I think that for the second case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this down to two parts and I'll talk about the second case in the second part. Let's go back.